So today we're finally going to do it. We're going to talk about Sisters of the Vast Black. Story. It's a short novella. It's out from Tor from quite a few months ago now at this point. And it follows this convent of, of nuns who are in space going about doing kind of really what's missionary work, um, a lot of service work. The nuns themselves are kind of this ragtag group of women who probably wouldn't have chosen to hang out with one another um, were they kind of just given free reign. They're stuck together though on a spaceship and that's made all the difference for them. And so they're going through space trying to figure out who they are and kind of coming into odds with both the government and with, well, with the papacy. It's not explicitly Catholic, but I'm pretty sure they're Catholic. In large part, I just really enjoyed this story. I thought the characters were charming. I thought the the story itself is compelling and really I was a big fan of a lot of the underlying questions that Rather brings up. She talks a lot about what it means to be a person of faith and what that might mean for somebody who really is struggling, who is seeing problems that they don't think their church is really addressing. And that's I think an incredibly relatable issue. The story kind of begins by addressing this idea of what your religion means for your identity and what brings you to it. So each of the nuns, of course, has their backstory. Some of them are brought to the faith because that's how they always felt. They felt genuinely called to the church and others had kind of a more roundabout path to, path to the church. And that in and of itself is interesting. You kind of come, you come to see the very multiplicitous ways and reasons that people have faith and what role it plays in their life. And as somebody who spent a lot of time among people who were really genuinely invested in their faith and looking to go into the Catholic Church, um, I think that that understanding that role is incredibly important. And that in and of itself was, I think, reason enough for me to pick it up. I find that story and that dialogue compelling. But there's also a very interesting point that Rather talks about, and that's this idea of what I'm going to call street-level bureaucracy. So street-level bureaucracy is a, a political theory. It's, it's part of organization theory and, and really plays a big role in the way that we talk about politics, even if you don't realize it. Street-level bureaucracy is a phrase that was coined by um, Michael Lipsky in the 1960s, who was a, kind of on the edge of sociology and political theory. Um, he did a bunch of different stuff, but that's what he's most known for. And what it essentially does is draws a distinction, a distinction between the ideals of a policy and the ways that they're implemented especially in instances where the policy is created by people outside of the community or system. So for instance, you have policies every day that are made by organizations like our legislature in Washington, DC, if you live in the US, or uh, the, your prime ministers in your House of Lords and House of Commons over in the UK. And those policies have, a, you know, a, ideally a clear meaning. But the reality of them is dependent upon the person who's actually doing the work. So for instance, policing reform is a really big deal and you can have this really large, well-founded um, kind of hierarchical policy that comes down from the top levels, but it really comes down to the actual police department and the person on the streets to know how those policies are implemented. And that that makes a huge difference. And you've seen, you know, historically we've seen this divide kind of have both good and bad kind of consequences. You know, there were times when um, when officers and, and educators refused to provide services to black communities. There have also been times when unjust policies are given, you know, huge. <laughs> there are also times when unjust policies are given huge leniency. 
So for instance, think uh, police departments refusing to enforce what they perceive as unjust policies. Um, I think, you know, decriminalization or functional decriminalization decided by a police department would be kind of the, the pinnacle example. I don't mean to have all of my examples be police officers. I think it's just topical right now. <laughs> And it's it's one of those examples that you talk about and when you very first start talking about this because it's very tangible. Um, not because it is the only place where this happens, you know. Think the DMV, right? Think about how hellish a cranky DMV administrator can make your life and how easy they can make your life. It's kind of the same idea there. In a lot of ways, street level bureaucracy can be fantastic and can really work as a way to provide really leniency and individualization in a system that doesn't really have that, right? We have these kind of overarching prescribed um, consequences for things in street level bureaucracy, you know, it lets people have wiggle room to deal with things on an individual basis. And in so many ways, that's fantastic. And it can really be a way for for communities to provide consistency and to bridge a gap between what might be like the local ethos, right, our, our ethical and moral system on a local level, as opposed to on the higher level, it gives people that bridge that they need. And Sisters of the Vast Black doesn't necessarily do this in a traditional way. It's, it's talking about this in regards to the church. And one of the primary conflicts is that there's this kind of ongoing, I don't know what you would call a pandemic, but across the entire galaxy. <laughs> there, there's a, there's a health, public health crisis going on. Um, and so the sisters are asked to do certain work, but then to withdraw a lot of their their personal mission, their their ministry, um, when it comes to certain communities because of either perception or um, because of the presence of this public health matter. And so they are left to decide, do we follow this guidance from higher ups who haven't been out to this outer ring system, who don't understand the needs of this system, or do we go in and do what we think is the correct thing either way? Um, and then of course the added layer of, and what does that mean when you have an entire hierarchical religious structure <laughs> that you are trying to operate within and that you are seeing is not necessarily meeting the needs of people? And for me, this this is fascinating. It's a, it's a book I've thought a lot about after reading it. Um, clearly it is not a, a perfect book, no book is. It's incredibly short, um, which is part of the, the good for it, and I think the characters are interesting and, and kind of lovely. Um, it'd be interesting, I think, for those of you who have a, a strong tie to a religious community to say what you think about it. Um, you know, I, I grew up bouncing between denominations. I am a confirmed Catholic, but I'm not necessarily, you know, somebody who practices a lot. Um, and so I would have, I'd be very interested to see the perspective from somebody who is quite devout. Um, but I don't know. Let me know what you thought about it, if you've read it. If not, I suggest picking it up. I think it's intriguing. Um, and I hope you guys are having a fantastic reading week. We'll talk to you later. Bye.